in our continuing study of the New Testament under the theme, it's all about Jesus. Thus far, we've studied nine books of the New Testament. There are a total of 27 books in the New Testament, so that means we've been through about a third of the books of the New Testament. We've been through some longer ones like Luke and the book of Acts. John is further along too. From this point on, we'll be taking a look at shorter books of the New Testament, but all under the theme, it's about Jesus. We've learned that Jesus is the fulfiller of all the promises of the Old Testament from Matthew, that Jesus is the mighty Savior from Mark, that Jesus is the merciful Savior. He loves all people from Luke, that Jesus is the Son of God come to earth to save people from John's Gospel, that Jesus is the Savior of all people, from the book of Acts. Last time we looked at four books, the epistle to the Galatians, the epistle of James, and the two epistles to the Thessalonians under the theme that Jesus is the liberator, that he's the one who sets us free from sin, free from the curse of the law, free to live for Jesus. Today, we're going to take a look at three books under the theme that Jesus is the righteousness of God. We'll look at the book of Romans, which is the longest of Paul's epistles, and that's why it's placed first in the list of epistles. And then we'll look at the next two epistles in the order in which they appear in the New Testament, first and second Corinthians. So the theme today is righteousness. Well, God says in his holy word, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. How can I ever hope to be as holy as God? God is perfect. God never makes mistakes. He never has made a mistake. I am sinful. I have not even begun to do what God demands. What am I to do? Well, take heart, my friend. The holiness God requires, he has provided for us in Christ Jesus. Christ is the righteousness of God, and God has declared you and me to be righteous for Jesus' sake. So the three letters that we're going to be looking at in this lesson uh, will help us understand this wonderful truth of Scripture that we are righteous before God thanks to Jesus. Well, first of all, the book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. We've heard about him before. Last week, we learned how he wrote Galatians and First and Second Thessalonians. And here's an artist's conception of Paul. Many people think that he was bald, but we don't know that for sure. Some people think that he had poor eyesight, but again, we don't know. Some people think he suffered from malaria, that this was the thorn in the flesh that he speaks about. But Again, that's not told to us. So when did Paul write the epistle to the Romans? Probably a little after the middle of the first century. Many people think he wrote it about the year of 57 AD. And from where did he write? From the city of Corinth. Paul spent some time in Corinth, Corinth, which is in Greece. So we'll take a look at a map in just a moment to see where these places are. And so he uh, was supporting himself oftentimes in places like Corinth, and he took the time to write the epistle to the Romans. To whom did he write? Well, the church in Rome, which consisted of Gentiles and Jews. In fact, we're going to learn that Paul knew many of the people in Rome. Perhaps many of them had come to Jerusalem years before for Pentecost and had been there when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost and were converted to Christianity, went back home to Rome and spread the word there so that a church had sprung up in the city of Rome. Why did Paul write to the Romans? It seems that he wanted to go farther west to the country of Spain. And so his purpose was to prepare for uh, this trip to Spain to help have the people in Rome maybe help him along, maybe provide some of his physical needs so that he could go to Spain. He had never been to Rome, and so he had never visited this congregation. And so his epistle to the Romans is very much like 
a complete treatment of the message of salvation. It begins with the fact that we are sinners, that by nature are under God's wrath, and then it speaks about how we are made righteous, how we are declared to be holy before God in Jesus, as we'll learn. So the theme of the book of Romans is this, that Christ is the righteousness of God for everyone who believes. And that's going to be the theme for this entire study, that Christ is the righteousness of God. Well, on this map, you can see where Corinth is located. It's right here in Greece, uh, right, right on the what's called the Isthmus of Corinth, connecting the mainland of Greece with the what's called the Peloponnesus, the sort of island. It's not really an island because it's connected by this strip of land. And over here is Rome, where Paul intended to go. So he's writing this epistle to the Romans from Corinth, and his plan is to go over to Rome as soon as he can. Well, this is an artist's conception of how Rome may have looked in the first century. And some of this still exists today. For example, over here is the Colosseum, where gladiators fought to the death, where Christians were put to death for their faith too. In this area is what is known as the Roman Forum. Today, uh, many of the ruins of these buildings are still here, but this is the way it may have looked in first century Rome. Over here is what's called the Circus Maximus. Today, it's just an open area. You can kind of see where it was, but uh, even the ruins do not remain of the Circus Maximus. If you ever saw the movie Ben-Hur, the chariot race in the movie, you maybe recognize this. This is pretty much the way it was depicted in that movie. There were many baths and temples all over the ancient city of Rome, and that's what many of these places are, gathering places. The um, marketplace was uh, in this area too. Where the Vatican in Rome is way across the Tiber River, up in this direction up here today. Wasn't there, of course, in the first century. Well, let's take a look at the epistle to the Romans. In the very first chapter, Paul mentions what his theme is going to be. And so he's talking about the ministry that he has had thus far in the various places that he's traveled and brought the gospel First he went to the Jews, then he also went to the Gentiles when the Jews rejected the gospel, when they refused to listen. And so these words, familiar words, are so beautiful. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Obviously, he's not ashamed of the gospel. After he was converted on the road to Damascus, he became an energetic, uh, totally committed preacher of the gospel. And the reason he's not ashamed is because it's the power of God. Now that word power is trans, uh, the translation of a Greek word, dynamis. We get our word dynamite from that. So Paul's really thinking of the gospel as it's like dynamite because it can do amazing, powerful, wonderful things. It brings salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes has salvation. First to the Jew. So the gospel, Jesus said, first of all, preach it to God's special people, but then to the Gentile. Gentiles, Jesus wanted everybody in the world to hear this message. It comes from God's chosen people of the Old Testament, but they are then in turn to spread it to everybody. Verse 17, for in the gospel, here we go, the righteousness of God is revealed. And what is this righteousness? Martin Luther struggled with the term righteousness when he was still searching and trying to find out what the message of the Bible really was. And when he first read about the righteousness of God, he thought it was the righteousness that God demands of us. And if we weren't righteous enough and weren't holy enough, we would be punished. And so Luther tried everything he could think of to be as holy and righteous as he could. He would go without food, he'd go without sleep, he would beat himself, and he never felt that he was righteous before God. He never had done enough. Well, what Paul is really saying, and Luther came to understand this eventually, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So this isn't righteousness that God demands of us. It's righteousness that God gives us, that he credits to us for Jesus' sake. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And Paul's are quoting from the Old Testament. 
Well, these first chapters of the epistle to the Romans are talking about the sinfulness of all people. All of us are totally corrupt from our conception and birth. And Paul gives a long list of examples of how we are totally sinful by nature. And if you scan these verses in chapter 3, verses 9 to 20, you're going to find all these statements. Let's just take a look at them. Uh, Paul says, no one is righteous. So there's not a single individual in all the history of the world. What, zillions of people? Nobody's ever been righteous except one, that was Jesus. No one understands. So nobody gets it. Nobody understands what God's message is. It's something no human being could ever have figured out that had to be revealed by God. No one seeks God. Well, people are aware of God. They know that he exists. Nature tells us that. The heavens declare the glory of God. I'm fearfully, wonderfully made, but we don't, we don't know the true God, and we're not really interested in, in learning about God because it's frightening. All have turned away. That's the condition of all people by nature. All have together become worthless. So totally sinful, nothing that deserves a God to love us or take us to himself. There's nothing of value in us. There's no one who does good, absolutely no one ever, their throats are open graves. If you can imagine uh, what an open grave might uh, be like, it's not a pleasant thought, but that's what our throats by nature are like. We're just corrupt and rotten. Their tongues practice deceit. That's all we know how to do by nature, is to be deceitful, hypocritical, lying. The poison of vipers is on their lips. The poison of a, of a snake is on our lips by nature. So we speak terrible things. We say hurtful things. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That's the way all people are by nature. We get upset. We get impatient. We start to curse our fate. We become bitter with other people, bitter with our life situation. Their feet are swift to shed blood. So we're just, just um, full of vengeance. We want to retaliate. We want to get even with people who have harmed us. Ruin and misery mark their ways. So destruction, chaos, havoc is something that comes naturally to us by nature. The way of peace, they do not know. We, we don't know how to live in peace, really. We can try to establish law and order and a peaceful society, but there's always going to be um, somebody. There are going to be people who will destroy that because that's what we are. We're sinful by nature. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Well, that's fear in the sense of, awe and worship before God. Uh, we are afraid of God by nature, but we don't have the proper fear that is awe and reverence of God. So then, uh, after talking about what our natural condition is, Paul in chapter 5 begins to speak about the blessings that we have in Christ. Actually, before this a little bit, he's talked about how we are righteous before God, that God has declared us to be righteous for Jesus' sake. We have Jesus' holiness. God thinks of us as holy. Uh, we use the big technical term justification or justified. And somebody once said a way to remember what that means is justified just as if I'd never sinned. And that's really what the word justified or declare righteous means. God looks at us as if we had never sinned. And because we are looked at by God in that way, we have certain blessings in Christ. And here's what Paul speaks about in chapter 5. We have peace with God. Now we really are at peace. We have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So we stand under the grace of God, the love we don't deserve in Christ Jesus, but it's ours through faith. It's become ours. And we have joy in the hope of the glory of God. Now when Paul uses the word hope here, he's not saying well, I hope but, you know, we might get to heaven someday. No, he's saying it's for sure. It's going to happen. We're going to be in heaven someday. It just hasn't happened yet, and that's what we're hoping for. And as we hope for it, we're filled with joy and rejoicing at the prospect of being in God's presence. And so that means we have joy in sufferings, no matter what happens in life. We know that God is in control of all things. He's going to make everything serve a good purpose for us because his purpose is to keep us with him until he takes us home to heaven. So it doesn't matter what happens. We willingly bear the cross. We uh, endure the persecution, whatever comes to us because of our faith in Jesus. 
and knowledge that suffering produces. So we know more about God as we suffer. It leads us into God's word to learn more about him. Perseverance. So we persevere. We can hang in there. We can endure, which in turn produces character and hope. So as we go through suffering and realize that God is strengthening us, he's upholding us, he's keeping us on the way to heaven, uh, it develops our Christian character and increases our hope. We hope for the life that's to come. We can't wait for being with Jesus in heaven, the kingdom of glory. And this hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So this isn't the kind of hope where people say, well, I hope it doesn't rain, but hope we don't have a storm, but they don't know. No, this hope is, is for real. It's definite. It's going to happen. And there will be no disappointment. We know that because we have the Holy Spirit who's worked that faith and trust and joy and love into our hearts. Then uh, Paul begins to compare Adam and Christ in chapter five, verses 18 and 19. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. So what Paul is talking about here is the first sin of Adam and Eve. And he's saying that that one trespass, that one sin resulted in all of Adam and Eve's descendants being under God's condemnation. When they disobeyed God and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which they were not to eat, that one sin condemned all their descendants. So that's the, the sin of Adam. Then Paul continues, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Now, here's something really interesting, significant. The one righteous act, that's Christ. Christ's perfect life never went sin by thought, word, or deed, and gave his holy life into death and Calvary's cross for us. So that righteous act resulted in, just as if I'd never sinned, justification and life, life now and life eternal for all people. Notice this. Um, Adam's sin brought punishment, condemnation for all people, and Jesus' righteous act of justification brought life for all people. So Jesus didn't die just for believers. He didn't die just for a certain select few. No, Jesus died for all people. God so loved the world that everybody who's ever lived in the world, ever will live in the world, Jesus paid the price for everybody. Verse 19, for justice through the disobedience of the one man. So the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many, and by the many, it really is an expression that means everybody. It isn't like most. No, it means everybody. We're made sinners, so we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, and that's Christ, Christ's perfect obedience, the many, that means everybody again, will be made righteous. It's ours through faith, but it's there for everybody because Jesus was righteous for, for everybody. Another interesting insight we see in chapter 7 of Romans is uh, something that Again, Luther really picked up on and made very much of the fact that we believers are sinners and saints at the same time. Now that's something that maybe strikes us as a little puzzling at first, but this is what it means. And we're gonna consider what Paul says here, that as long as we live, we are totally, completely sinful. There'll never come a day when I can say, well, I don't sin anymore. I've graduated beyond, sinning no to the moment of death to the very last breath i'm gonna have to confess i am sinful but i am also a saint and the saint is somebody who is holy and that's the way god sees me god sees me as one who is holy because jesus was righteous in my place he was holy in my place so when we meet god when we leave this world and meet god god's only going to see Jesus' righteousness. He's not going to see our sins at all. He doesn't see them anymore because um, Jesus was holy in our place. Let's consider a little bit about what Paul is uh, saying in these verses. We are totally sinners. Nothing good lives in our sinful natures, Paul says. Sin living in us keeps us from doing that which is good. And we sometimes refer to that as the old Adam or the old man in us always keeps dragging us down, but we are also totally saints 
we're totally holy because of Christ. And sometimes we speak of that as the new man in us, the believing part of us, according to the inner being, that's the new person by faith in Christ, the new man, we delight in God's law. So as a believer, as a Christian, I find God's law especially beautiful and wonderful as the old Adam keeps fighting against that, but the new man is going to win the victory. In chapter 12, Paul talks about what it means that we're living uh, under God's mercy. God's mercy means his, his pitying love. Um, he looks at us in our lost condition, and he loves us, and he wants to save us. Because we know of God's mercy in Christ Jesus, these are the things it's going to mean in our lives. We will want to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. God doesn't, uh, doesn't require animal sacrifices anymore. The one sacrifice of Christ fulfilled all of those blood sacrifices of the Old Testament. And now we offer our bodies, the members of our bodies, everything we are uh, as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. There are a couple of technical terms that our Lutheran confessions use, uh, propitiatory and Eucharistic sacrifices. Well, and just to explain quickly, propitiatory means that what Christ did on the cross, the atonement. There's one propitiatory sacrifice. Nothing that we sacrifice contributes in any way, shape, or form to our standing before God. All of our sacrifices are Eucharistic, and that's a word that means thanksgiving. Uh, we just are so grateful and thankful to Jesus for what he did for us that that's how we want to live. Our bodies are living sacrifices. So we will want to, in light of God's mercy, no longer conform to the pattern of this sinful world. We don't want to go along with the sins and attitudes and ideas and corruption and problems of this world, but we want to be transformed, transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can test what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. So we want our, not, our minds constantly to be renewed. And the more we study God's word, the more we uh, live in that gospel message of Christ, the more our minds are being made new. So that now we will want to love sincerely, not loving somebody to see what we can get out of it. No, just totally giving the love that God showed to us in Christ. And we want, to, we want to hate what is evil. We see a lot of evil around us in society. We want to hate that. We can't tolerate that. We don't go along with that. We have evil welling up from inside ourselves, too, and we hate that. We cling to what is good, what is wholesome, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is true. We want to be devoted to others in love, serving others in love, honor others above ourselves. That's not an easy thing to do, is it? Because by nature, we are so wrapped up in self Oh, we just want to take care of the big number one, that's us first. But no, we need to think about others before we think of ourselves. Always seeking to do what we can to serve and help them and to be zealous in serving the Lord. So that's what motivates us now. We just are eager. We're desirous to do everything we can in service of our Lord. Because of God's mercy, we will want to be joyful in hope. So you and I as believers have every cause, every reason to be so happy and joyful because of our sinful nature. That's not always true, but we need to really strive to be joyful in our hope. We can be patient in affliction no matter what happens to us in life, whether it's mental, physical, sickness, disease, whatever. We can be patient in that affliction because we know God's in control of all things and faithful in prayer. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath. We just want to keep praying, talking to God, because that's what it means that since God loves us so much, we want to show our love to him. So we praise him, we thank him in prayer too. And we want to share with the people of God who are in need and practice hospitality. So there are fellow believers who may be poor and destitute and have troubles, we want to help them out. We want to provide for them. And, and we want to be hospitable. We want to take them into our homes, give them a meal, whatever it might be, to, to serve and help. And we want to do that for people outside the church, too. And, and as we do that, as we seek to feed the hungry, help the homeless, 
we also want to bring the most important message we can bring, and that's the good news of Jesus. As we give them food, and whatever else, we want to tell them, and we've got something really special, wonderful to share with you, and that's the good news about Jesus. Well, because of God's mercy in Christ Jesus, we want to bless and not curse those who, who persecute us. And as Christians, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be laughed at. We're going to be ridiculed, and probably more and more as we come to the end of the world. But instead of retaliating, instead of revenge, we just want to bless and show love uh, to those who persecute us. We want to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So if somebody's happy, let's be happy with them. Don't be envious. Um, don't think, well, that's not fair that that person's happy. No, be happy with them. And if somebody is in sorrow, somebody's troubled about something, we want to be sorrowful with them and mourn with them. Just out of love and compassion for them. We want to live in harmony with others, especially our fellow believers. We just want to be one in Christ and, and not um, go after each other about petty, uh, unimportant things, but just live in harmony and patience and love with others. We want to be humble and associate with people of low position. So we dare never begin to think, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm too good a person to associate with somebody who's really, really poor, or destitute, or is a beggar on the street. No, uh, we just want to remember who we are, that we're sinners redeemed by the blood of Jesus, we're righteous before God, and that's true for everybody. And so we just want to associate with people to help them know about Jesus too. We want to avoid being conceited. That's something, again, that's such a dangerous thing to fall into, and it comes so naturally to us as sinners, that we get all wrapped up in self. We want to avoid that. Just think outside of ourselves. Think about other people. Not repay anyone evil for evil. So people are going to do bad things to us. Let's face it, it happens all the time. But instead of revenge or retaliation or getting even, we just want to repay it with kindness and love. And never, and like Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Be careful to do what is right. Whatever we do in life, we want to be sure that it's pleasing to God that it's something that helps others, that it serves people, serves God, and always being careful to do that. We want to live in peace with everyone. Maybe we've got a, a neighbor who isn't all that friendly, but we need to be friendly to that neighbor and be at peace and help and serve people around us, even if they don't do that for us. It doesn't matter. We just want to live it at peace. We don't want to have... Uh, People think of us as enemies. I mean, they might, but we don't want to be an enemy to them. We want to be at peace with them, not take revenge. And anyway, we've kind of talked about that already. So that's Paul's epistle to the Romans. And it's all about uh, the fact that we are righteous in Jesus. Christ is the righteousness of God for everyone who believes. And you and I as believers have that certainty. Well, now we come to another epistle of Paul which speaks about the righteousness that we have in Jesus. And that is the first letter to the Corinthians. And this letter was written pretty close to the same time, maybe even a little earlier than Paul's epistle to the Romans. And Paul seems to have written this in about the year AD 55, 55 years after um, in the year of our Lord. Well, many problems had arisen in the congregation in Corinth. Paul had been there earlier, and then he got a report that there were all kinds of issues there. There was party strife. There were cliques developing in the congregation. They weren't talking to each other. They weren't associating with one another. There was immorality in the congregation, too, and they were just kind of letting it go. They didn't say anything about it. And some members of the congregation <clears throat> were taking other members to court, they were suing them in a court of law. There were a lot of questions in Corinth about such things as marriage, about Christian freedom, about worship in general, about the Lord's Supper, about spiritual gifts, about the resurrection even from the dead. So Paul has to deal with all of these problems and all these questions in, in his epistle to his first epistle to the Corinthians. And what's fascinating about this is that Paul always, always directs his readers back to Christ and the righteousness that we have 
in Christ and what did Jesus did for us on the cross. Well, it's thought that Paul wrote this first epistle from Ephesus, and there was a, a temple to the goddess Artemis in Ephesus. We'll find out where Ephesus is located on the map in a little bit. But uh, this is an artist's conception of what that temple might have looked like. It's not there today, but uh, it's also known as the Temple of Diana. And uh, Paul had run into problems there in Ephesus because they were selling little statues of Diana, silver statues, and Paul speaking out against that. And people, uh, Demetrius and others were upset with Paul for doing that. So he's writing to the Christians in Corinth, people who were living in extreme immorality. In fact, there was a, a term that was used in the Mediterranean world in the first century. Uh, if a person was called a Corinthian, uh, that meant he was really corrupt. People just said, oh, that means that's, that person is totally immoral, dishonest, corrupt in every way. And to Corinthianize somebody was to make them corrupt and, and, and living a horrible life too. So the temple of... Um, the Aphrodite was there at, um, at Corinth, and it's uh, believed that there were at least 12 heathen temples in Corinth. It wasn't a huge city, but there were 12 heathen temples there. So why did Paul write this letter? To instruct the Christians in Corinth and to restore the church in its areas of weakness, the problems that they had. He needed to help them out. And this is the theme of first corinthians we are declared righteous in the name of the lord jesus christ and because we are declared righteous we want to lead righteous lives and so we don't want these issues to divide us we don't want this immorality to be found in our midst well here's where corinth is located on this isthmus of corinth it's called and this is the Peloponnesus. here's mainland greece here's athens i'm fairly far away from corinth and here's a picture of what uh, the area of Corinth looks like today. It's all ruins, but here's a mountain that's right next to the city of ancient Corinth. And you can sort of see buildings and walls up here in the top of this rather flat mountaintop. And this is the, this was called the Acropolis. In Athens, the high mountain is called the Acropolis, which means the high city. And here in the Acrocorinthus means high Corinth. And up here on this mountain were all kinds of temples and all kinds of pagan worship, totally immoral things that were going on up here on this mountaintop. Here's a reconstruction of ancient Corinth. And you can see there was a, a theater here. Hardly any of this is left today. It's just a few ruins, but it was a typical Greek city. And they have some Roman influence in it too, temples, temple of Apollo, and so on. So why does Paul say what he does in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians? Um, he is going to say that the gospel of God had worked mightily in their midst. And it's really interesting how Paul begins 1 Corinthians. He knows that they've got tons and tons of problems and issues, immorality and everything else going on, but yet the way he starts this letter is amazing. I'm just going to read for you. If you have your Bible handy, you can turn to this too. First Corinthians chapter one, verses four to nine. Here's how Paul really begins after the greetings. He's sending greetings. And then he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> now he knows about all these problems, but he's thanking God for them. For in him and God, you have been enriched in every way. In other words, you've got lots of talents in all your speaking and in all your knowledge because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So we came and preached the gospel message. The gospel message. You believed it, and it's evident in how you've been living. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts. You've got all these talents, gifts, abilities, uh, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So you're, you, you've got the gifts. You're looking forward to Jesus coming back. And then he says in verse 8, Jesus will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord is faithful. So he's going to keep you in the faith. Uh, God had worked mightily. They did not lack any spiritual gift and were eagerly waiting for Jesus' return. And then God who had called them to faith would keep them until the end. 
Now, why does Paul start this way? Uh, it's, it's for this reason. Only in the context of the gospel can Paul begin to deal with the problems in their midst. And as we consider some of the problems in Corinth, it's fascinating to see how Paul always brings it back to the gospel because the gospel is the motivation for proper Christian living. Paul knows that, and that's why he emphasizes it constantly. And we need to do the same thing today, not to be legalistic, um, moralistic, but evangelical. Let the gospel work in people's hearts. So what were the problems and what were Paul's solutions? Let's take a look. There were divisions in the church. In chapter 3, he talks about these divisions. There were some who uh, liked Paul, some who liked uh, Peter, some who liked Apollos. He had been there too, preaching. Uh, and then there was a Christ party too. They were actually the worst because they thought they were better than anybody else. So Paul tells them not to boast about Peter or Apollos or Paul himself. Don't boast about men as he reminds them that they are of Christ and Christ is of God. So boast in Christ. And not this Christ party, which is just a political party, but in Jesus, your Savior, who is from God, and you've got righteousness in him. So now he, so he's solving the divisions of the church. They're, they're factions. They're just fighting with one another. And Paul says, no, we, we're united in Christ. Let's get over that faction business. Let's be united in Jesus. Then the problem of immorality. And, and what he's referring to here is that there was a man in the congregation who was guilty of incest. He had married his um, mother-in-law, really. And it was offensive. And people knew about it, and they let it go. And so Paul says that remembering that Christ, the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, has been sacrificed for them, they should get rid of the old yeast of malice and wickedness. Now he's referring to the Jewish festival of uh, Passover because in the days after they celebrated the Passover, they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For a week after that Passover festival, they were to sweep the house clean of any yeast or leaven. And now Paul says, just as you did that, you just did that, did that you need to sweep the house clean of this yeast that works like yeast that just starts to fester and grow and cause more problems. Get rid of that malice and wickedness. And then the next problem, there were lawsuits among believers. They were taking each other to court, suing one another, trying to get as much money as they could. It was a very litigious society, and even the church in Corinth was affected by that. And so Paul saws that with the gospel again. He says, reminds them that they were washed. Now you were what it, he's referring to baptism. You were washed in the baptism. You were sanctified, made holy. You're justified, just as if you never sinned, declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus. So if that's true, and it is, there's you can't justify bringing lawsuits against your fellow believers in Jesus. Then there were questions about marriage and related matters. So is it better to remain uh, celibate, to remain unmarried? Paul was. And Paul said he had been given that special gift, and for him it was fine. But he said for most people, probably getting married is a better way to be. Uh, he was happy to be unmarried because it freed him up to just travel and preach and spread the gospel all over the place. Um, and having a wife and family might not make that as easy, but it's God's plan is marriage. It's one of his institutions, it's one, and the family is an institution. So it's a good thing, and you should thank God for that. So, so he uses the gospel again. He says, since you were bought at a price, the price is the blood of Jesus, you should not become the slaves of men. So don't let people tell you that uh, being unmarried is better or that being uh, married is makes you holier. Don't fall victim to those ideas of men. And then there were questions about whether you could eat meat that had been offered to an idol. Lots of idol temples. 12 temples there in Corinth. And so in the marketplace, they would sell meat that had initially been offered to an idol at one of these temples. And there were some Christians who said, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. I can't do that. That's just wrong. But other Christians in the congregation were saying, well, it doesn't make any difference. It's just meat. Um, I, I don't even think about it being offered to an idol. 
So Paul, this was really a matter of what we call adiaphora, things neither commanded nor forbidden. God never said you can or you can't eat that meat. And so Paul says, there's one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. And so let's not let that become a divisive issue. Let's just treasure our unity in Jesus and accept one another, no matter how you feel about that matter. Well, then uh, Paul talks about his rights as an apostle. There were people who had come into Corinth and had said that Paul, well, Paul was not a very good preacher. Um, and he wasn't one of the original disciples like Peter was. He's an apostle come lately. And so they didn't think he was that good. And so Paul has to remind them that um, God, Jesus himself, called Paul to be an apostle. And he says this, he and his companions have put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So he's just happy for anybody who preaches the gospel. Apollos did it, great. Peter did it, great. Others did it, wonderful. And I'm just one of those who came to preach to you the good news. And, and Paul says that he had become all things to all people for the sake of the gospel so that he could share his blessings. So I, I just want you to know, I don't care who gets the credit for it because it doesn't. that's not the important thing. It's not a personality contest. It's not one preacher is better than another. No, it's just that the message of Jesus gets to you. Whoever brings it, thank God for that. That's fantastic. They had questions about the Lord's Supper, and they were messing that up big time. They'd have kind of a potluck, a festival before they worship and have the Lord's Supper, and this was called the love feast. The Greek word for that is agape feast, and what was happening is that they were, some of them were drinking too much wine, they, then they were coming to worship to have the Lord's Supper, and they were intoxicated. And so Paul is saying, that's not the proper way to prepare for the Lord's Supper. What you need to realize is what Jesus instituted. And this, by the way, is uh, one of four places in the New Testament where the words of institution are recorded in 1 Corinthians 11. The other three places are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So um, he says, whoever eats or drinks in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So when we receive the Lord's Supper, together with the bread and wine, we're receiving Christ for a body and blood. And if you're intoxicated, if you're at odds with your fellow Christians, you're not paying attention to what this is all about. And then you're actually guilty of um, sinning against the body and blood of the Lord because you're not understanding what you're doing. You're not taking seriously what you're doing. And then spiritual gifts. Uh, people were beginning to say that some gifts were better than others, that their gifts were superior to the gifts that other people had. Paul says, no, no, uh, God gives gifts to everybody. Everybody has talents, abilities, and we just need to appreciate them and, and realize God gave them and treasure them and give everybody an opportunity to serve one another because we're all part of Christ's body and the church is made up of many parts. Each part is a part of the body of Christ. And so you can't say that somehow the eyes are better than the ears or the mouth is better than the nose or you know, just don't say silly things like that. Every part of the body is important for the body of Christ. Then there were people who wondered whether there really would be a resurrection from the dead. So we have this beautiful, 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where Paul says, definitely, Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, that means you and I are going to be raised from the dead too, to live with him forever in heaven. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and it's such a beautiful chapter. Those verses particularly are really, really fun to look at and think about and realize what God has given us in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So that's 1 Corinthians. It's a beautiful uh, declaration, again, of how we are righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that means in our daily lives as believers. Then 2 Corinthians, it seems it was written not too long after 1 Corinthians, perhaps in the same year, 55, and again from Ephesus. And why did Paul write 2 Corinthians? Well, 1 Corinthians had been received in Corinth, and people had been um, reading it, thinking about what Paul had said. But then some false teachers 
had come into Corinth and they were saying, well, Paul, why are you listening to Paul? He's, uh, he doesn't have the same kind of authority that Peter does, for example. Paul is, he's a persecutor and he was a, a terrible guy. So they were challenging Paul's integrity and also his authority. And so what Paul emphasizes in 2 Corinthians is the same thought again. In Christ, we are the righteousness of God. And so in the first chapter, he uh, says this, Jesus is always yes. Um, in other words, it's such, it's such a positive message. We always need to proclaim and treasure this positive, wonderful message Jesus is always yes. It's not no, it's yes all the time. And what he means is this. All of God's promises are yes in Christ. Whatever promise God has made, he fulfills it in Jesus. And it is God who makes us stand firm in Christ. So we just cling to the promises of God in Christ Jesus. These are all positive, wonderful things God has given us. Then in chapter 2, he speaks about how the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved, it's a pleasant fragrance, like a beautiful perfume, and, but it smells terrible among those who are perishing. So what he means by those words is this, that Paul and his companions were spreading the fragrance of Christ. That's the gospel to people everywhere. This is the sweet-smelling, wonderful, good news of Jesus. And those who believe in Jesus found it to be the fragrance of life. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever smelled. It's the most wonderful thing. But people who heard the gospel and rejected it, they said, oh, that's, that's foul, that's terrible, that's putrid, it stinks. They found it to be the smell of death. So it's all in how people receive the gospel. And then in chapter 5, he talks about the purpose of our lives. What is the purpose of our lives? Paul says it's this. We no longer live for ourselves. It's not all about me. It's not my pleasures and my happiness and my pastimes and my vacations and all about, no, it's about, it's about Jesus. It's about him who died for us. Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins and we were declared righteous because of what Jesus did and was raised again. So he was delivered into death for our offenses, for our sins, and was raised again from the dead for our justification, for our assurance that we are righteous before God. What is the ministry of reconciliation? Now that word reconciliation is a big theological word. What it really means is to be at peace with God. Uh, we are at peace with God. And let's see what Paul means by that. He says it is the privilege, of those of us who have this ministry, we have this privilege of telling others that God has reconciled. And that means he's made peace between us and himself in Christ. Uh, that he doesn't count our sins against us because Jesus paid for them all. Because he made Jesus, Jesus who had no sin, to be sin for us. So Jesus is perfect. Absolutely no sin in him. And so J Jesus took all of our sins upon himself, every sin of every last person in all the history of the world, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. And this is really the theme verse of 2 Corinthians, that because of what Jesus did, his perfect life uh, and his innocent sufferings and death, that has established peace between us and God. We are now um, righteous before God. The way our Lutheran confessions um, explain this matter of reconciliation is really this. <clears throat> they say that, um, our status with God has changed. God remains the same. God is holy, just, perfect, um, demands that sin be punished, and you and I remain the same too. We are sinful, we'll be sinful till the day we die. But because of Christ, our status with God has changed. Now, God sees us through Christ, and in Christ we are now perfect and holy, forgiven. And so he sees us as back to this idea of sinner saint again. He sees us as saints because Christ has reconciled us, made peace between us and God. In chapter 12, um, the question is really answered by Paul. How did Paul come to understand the purpose of his sufferings and weaknesses? And Paul had plenty of them, it seems. Uh, he speaks about his thorn in the flesh. He pleaded with God 
three times that God would take it away. And God said, no, my grace is enough for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. What that weakness was, people have speculated. We really don't know. People think maybe poor eyesight. It's a possibility. Malaria. We don't know. But how did Paul deal with those sufferings and weaknesses? His weaknesses helped him appreciate Christ's power all the more. Uh, Paul talks about everything that he experienced in his ministry. He was shipwrecked. Um, so he was going to drown. He was beaten with rods. He was scourged. He was in prison and, and just stoned and treated shamefully, persecuted, ridiculed, laughed at, run out of the city. One time, cast out of the city and stoned. They thought he was dead. But how does Paul react to all this? All these experiences helped him appreciate Christ's power all the more and how wonderful it was to know that power in Christ. So that's really the beautiful book of 2 Corinthians. In Christ, we are the righteousness of God. Now, here's a little diagram to help us think about this righteousness and what it really means. If you look at the left side of this diagram, you can see over here the word righteousness in white, and you see the word sin in black. And here's Jesus. Jesus is holy. He's righteous. He's entirely God, entirely man. He's perfect in every way, every thought, word, and deed. And over here, this is us. We are sinful in every way. Um, every thought, word, deed. And we're born, uh, conceived and born in sin. So this little mathematical formula down here. So Jesus is holiness. He's perfect holiness, plus holiness. Jesus, no sin, minus sin. And that's what God requires for anybody to have eternal life. You have to be perfect, completely perfect. Every thought word deed has to be perfect. There can be absolutely no sin. And But here's our situation by nature. This is who we are. We have no holiness whatsoever by nature or in our lives. And we're just filled with sin. And what does this lead to? Eternal death, separation from God. As God says, the soul of sins, it shall die. It doesn't mean just physical death. He means eternal death in hell. Now what God did, and this is what this, these three books are really all about, the righteousness of God, Jesus is our righteousness. God brought about this great exchange. Jesus took all of our sin on himself. When he suffered and died on the cross, he paid for all those sins. And his perfect righteousness, his perfect life was credited to us. So God now says, you, you and I, are holy and righteous before him because of Jesus. And that's why we call it God's great exchange. It's nothing we did, not, nothing that we can boast or brag about, but it's what Jesus himself did for us. And so um, one other thing to look at on that previous page, and I'll see if I can make that come back here. Uh, or maybe not. Um, well, what it, what it was also pointing out was that uh, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And we didn't get it now. Nope. Um, let's try it this way. I'm sorry to, uh, to mess this up a little bit. But you can see here on the right side of this diagram, God says this. The Lord has laid on him, this on Jesus, the iniquity. And the word iniquity means the guilt of us all. That's this beautiful Old Testament book, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. And so because Jesus took all of our guilt, all of our sins, we are now perfect before him. Jesus from the cross said this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, that's what Jesus experienced. He experienced what we should have experienced, that we should have been forsaken by God forever. But because Jesus experienced that for us, he experienced the punishment that we should have had we are assured of righteousness and eternal life. And then Jesus from the cross said these beautiful words. And when he spoke in Aramaic from the cross, it was just one word. And that one word is translated in this way. It is finished. What Jesus did on the cross accomplished our salvation. It was completely done. Everything had been accomplished. We are now righteous before God. And here's this beautiful verse we were talking about. For 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where Paul says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, and that's what that diagram was telling us, had no sin to be sin for us. God's good exchange. 
so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So because of what Jesus did, we are now righteous before God. And that's the wonderful comfort we have in the gospel. So this is what we've looked at today in the box there you see, the, the righteousness of God uh, in the epistle of Paul to the Romans and first and second Corinthians. Next week, our theme is going to be that Jesus is the bringer of joy. Oh, the Lord knows we need lots of joy in our lives. And there, there are some joyful thoughts in these four epistles. They're all relatively short epistles of the Apostle Paul. But the theme we're going to concentrate on is uh, this wonderful joy that we have. And there's one verse from Philippians that is so beautiful. We'll talk about it. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, rejoice in all things. And that's the kind of joy that Jesus gives us and that we want more and more to be expressed in our lives. God's blessings to you as you continue to dig into God's word, and we'll see you next time.